Good evening. My name is Jessica Roman, and I hold the distinct pleasure of acting as program manager for the incredible Center for Digestive Health team here at Virginia Mason Franciscan Health. It is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's lecture. We host a lecture series yearly on a host of topics of digestive concerns. The Center for Digestive Health is comprised of a team of pathologists, gastroenterologists, surgeons, oncologists, endocrinologists, and radiologists who are looking to optimize care of the patient through a culture of quality, focus on access, innovations in research, and educating the next generation of caregivers. By emphasizing innovative and quality patient care and research and education, we provide excellence in our clinical programs, including the Center for Weight Management, featuring bariatric surgery and medical weight loss, GI cancer prevention, colon and rectal disorders, esophageal, liver, pancreas, and biliary diseases, along with IBS and motility disorders. And education and research is truly embedded in everything that we do. Our team of providers from multiple specialties work together to improve your health and well-being, teach the world about what we do best, translate cutting-edge research from lab to bedside, pursue quality initiatives to provide the very best care, and discover innovations to transform your experience. Since 1982, our national breakthroughs have impacted treatment of digestive disease at the regional, national, and international levels. And while we feel that digestive health at Virginia Mason Franciscan Health is very special, we have been honored to be awarded numerous accolades over the years, a reflection of the hard work of our providers and their dedication to their patients. <clears throat> Our speakers this evening are advanced practitioner Jennifer Fior and clinical dietitian Lily Wren. Jennifer Fior completed her master's in nursing science from Rush University in Chicago and received a postmaster advanced practitioner certificate from Lewis University in, in Illinois. Jennifer has experience as a gastroenterology nurse, nutrition nurse practitioner, as well as a gastrointestinal nurse practitioner. She joined VMFH in 2022, where she focuses on functional motility and hereditary GI cancers. Lily Wren attended the University of British Columbia, where she majored in food, nutrition, and health with a specialization in dietetics. Lily joined Virginia Mason in 2022, where she is a certified FODMAP dietitian and focuses on general nutrition, urology and kidney stones, GI, and neurology and ALS. We're so honored to have both Jennifer and Lily presenting this evening and look forward to engaging in them in discussion during their Q&A session after their presentations. Thank you, Jessica, for that lovely introduction. As she said, I'm Jen. I'm a GI nurse practitioner here at Virginia Mason, and tonight we're going to be talking about beating the bloat, exploring causes, remedies, and dietary approaches. I'm personally going to start on the causes and the treatments for bloating. So what exactly is bloating? Well, who does it affect? Bloating affects approximately 20 to 30 percent of the population and can be even higher in those who have underlying conditions. What exactly is bloating? It's a sensation of abdominal fullness or pressure from trapped gas, and there can be visible distension and increased abdominal girth. Abdominal bloating is quite complex and can be the result of many different factors, including, but not limited to, intestinal gas, gut microbiota, contents in inside the intestines such as stool, and motility of the intestines. So what are the causes of bloating? Well, as you can see here, there are many different causes that I'm going to be going through in the next few slides. The first up, infections. There are two different types of infections. One is a parasitic infection that is known as Giardia that's found in water sources, foodborne illnesses, and through the oral fecal realm. The other is a bacterial infection known as H. pylori, which can also be found in foodborne illnesses, contaminated soil, or again, through the oral fecal realm. And typically, with symptoms of Giardia, you're going to experience diarrhea, foul-smelling stools, fatty stools, nausea, sometimes abdominal cramping, and very rarely weight loss. But in about 71% of patients, you'll experience bloating. It is quite similar to H. pylori, and, but with H. pylori, instead, you're going to experience abdominal pain, nausea, difficulty finishing a meal, and bloating. These can be found through stool studies, such as antigen tests, as well as endoscopically. 
Now with uh, H. pylori, you can also find this via breath test and blood tests. However, the blood tests are not typically recommended. So what do we do if we find an infection? We treat the infection. And the way that we treat infections are different for Giardia and H. pylori. For Giardia, it is a specific antibiotic that is a one-dose antibiotic versus H. pylori, which is an antibiotic mixed with a proton pump inhibitor. A proton pump inhibitor may be known as omeprazole, pantoprazole, or isomeprazole, and that is in combination with an antibiotic course. This can either be two different antibiotics or two different antibiotics and a peptobismol. Next is pancreatic insufficiency. This is a result of chronic pancreas disease leading to insufficient enzyme release into the small intestine to help digest food. Typically, in the pancreas, you'll have a release of enzymes known as lipase, amylase, and protease, and these help break down carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. If you have difficulty releasing these into the small intestine, you do not break down the food, therefore do not absorb the food properly, which can be left with symptoms such as abdominal pain, bloating, fatty, or oily stools. So what causes pancreatic insufficiency? Usually it is damage done to the pancreas, such as pancreatitis or pancreatic duct injury. Additionally, small bowel or gastric um, surgeries can affect pancreatic insufficiency as well, such as a gastric bypass. Cystic fibrosis has also been linked to pancreatic insufficiency. Again, how do we test for this? We look for stool studies. We do two tests typically together. One is a fecal fat test to check for fat malabsorption. The other is a pancreatic fecal elastase, which checks for protein malabsorption. And if you have evidence of a fecal elastase that is low, it is a good indicator that you're not properly digesting your food from pancreatic insufficiency. So we supplement with those enzymes. We replace them during meals to help break down the food and hence absorb it better, limiting the symptoms. Next up is constipation. Constipation is typically defined as a bowel movement less than once, um, once every three days or having consistently hard stools, excessive pushing, straining, force, or incomplete evacuation. There are many symptoms that go along with constipation, including abdominal bloating, gas, distension, pain, and sometimes you can have pelvic pain or anal rectal pain. There are many causes to constipation. The biggest causes to constipation are typically slow transit constipation, neuro disorders such as Parkinson's disease, metabolic disorders such as thyroid disease, obstructions such as tumors or blockages in the intestines, irritable bowel syndrome, medication-induced constipation such as opioids, or outlet obstructions, for example, pelvic floor dysfunction. So how do we test for constipation? This can be a broad differential oftentimes, so we may utilize a bunch of different tests, including blood labs to check thyroid, you may even see x-rays to check the stool burden. In some cases, we might use a SITS marker study, which is a motility study that looks at the delayed transit of, colon, uh, of stool inside the colon. Additionally, if we're looking for pelvic floor dysfunction, we may utilize uh, pelvic floor studies such as a defecography study or an anal rectum manometry. And oftentimes, we'll utilize a colonoscopy if we see red flag symptoms. Those red flag symptoms include anemia of unknown causes, rectal bleeding, unintentional weight loss, change in bowel habits greater than two weeks, especially in those who have not had a prior colonoscopy, especially if they're over the age of 45. We also make this consideration for family history of inflammatory bowel disease and family history of colon cancer. Oftentimes, our first treatment is therapy that includes dietary and lifestyle modifications, which I will refer to Lily to take uh, from here forward. From a medication perspective, we'll try to use over-the-counter things first, such as stool softeners or osmotic laxatives, which might be something along the lines of Miralax or magnesium oxide. We may use surfactants, such as Colace, or stimulant laxatives, such as Senna or Docolax. If this becomes a little more problematic, we may elicit some use of prescriptions such as secreting medications like Linzess, Trulance, or Amatiza. 
Oftentimes, if that does not work, we might go further and use Motegrity or Misoprostol. If we cannot find a cause for your chronic constipation or we're suspicious for pelvic floor dysfunction, we may consider doing pelvic floor therapy or consider a referral to our colorectal surgeons to evaluate for possible anatomical abnormalities or potentially even surgical interventions for treatment of chronic constipation. Next up, we have functional dyspepsia. This is a condition where you'll have an upset stomach or indigestion without a clear cause. Symptoms oftentimes include fullness after meals, difficulty finishing a meal, upper abdominal pain, or bloating. And we'll test this with blood labs, stool studies, potentially even an endoscopy, or imaging. And this is essentially to rule out other organic diseases. For example, celiac disease, H. pylori, peptic ulcer disease, organic diseases on an ultrasound or CT, or even a gastric emptying study. For the treatment, again, we'll elicit the first line therapy, which is dietary and lifestyle modifications, which I will let Lily cover later. If we're trying to treat medically, we'll consider acid-reducing medications, such as proton pump inhibitors, as I previously mentioned, and this usually ranges from four to eight weeks. If things do not get any better, we'll then try neuromodulators, for example, noratriptyline or amitriptyline, for another eight to 12 weeks. If we still cannot find um, an improvement with these neuro neuromodulators, we will consider doing a prokinetic for approximately four weeks. Keep in mind that there are supplements that have also been studied and have been shown to have good improvement in symptomatic, uh, good symptomatic improvement, such as FD-Guard, Iberogast, or turmeric. If we still find that you're having issues despite all of that, we'll consider a referral to psychotherapy for functional dyspepsia. Next up is gastroparesis. This is delayed emptying of the stomach in an absence of mechanical obstruction, meaning that there's nothing downstream that's blocking the stomach from emptying, such as an ulcer or a tumor. Essentially, the symptoms of this would be from nausea, sorry, the symptoms of this would be nausea and vomiting, abdominal fullness with meals, bloating, and upper abdominal pain. Oftentimes, the causes can be pretty extensive, including diabetes, idiopathic, meaning we can't quite find a reason, viral, post-surgical, neurologic diseases, autoimmune diseases, or some other diseases such as Ehlers-Danlos, POTS, or mast cell activation syndrome. Keep in mind that there are medications that can also delay the emptying of the stomach, which can be drug-induced gastric delayed emptying. These medications include marijuana, opioids, and these new GLP-1 agonists that interfere. How do we test for this? The gold standard is diagnosing with a gastric emptying study for four hours with solids. We'll utilize this test to see how slow your stomach empties, and if there's greater than 10% at the end of the study, this is considered delayed gastric emptying. For treatment, again, dietary and lifestyle modifications is a first-line therapy, which I will let Lily cover. Um, and when we try treating medically, we'll go through basically symptomatic improvement. We tend to address the symptoms. For example, if you have nausea, we try to treat with antiemetics. If you have pain, we try to treat with neuromodulation. If you have difficulty accommodating food in the stomach, we try to work with something that'll help stretch the tone and allow for gastric accommodation. And we may even try to move the speed of the stomach with prokinetics. If we find that that's not helpful, we can elicit other different techniques such as pyloric intervention, which can include Botox injections, pyloroplasty, or something called a G-POM. Additionally, we, for people who have nausea and vomiting predominant symptoms, we can utilize a gastric neurostimulator. And if all of these fail, we do have some surgical options that are reserved for special cases. Next up is small intestine bacterial overgrowth, or SIBO. SIBO is a condition where there's excessive colonic bacteria present in the small intestine. This can, again, come with a bunch of different symptoms, including abdominal discomfort, flatulence, watery diarrhea, fatty, greasy stools, bloating, and, of course, in rare cases, weight loss. 
There are many causes to SIBO, and of course, finding the underlying issue is the best way to treat SIBO. However, this can be difficult because, as I mentioned, there are many causes. Some of those include functional motility disorders, such as irritable bowel syndrome. Sometimes even medications can affect this. Structural disorders, such as uh, small bowel diverticulum, tumors, or even potentially strictures or narrowing from previous disease, such as inflammatory bowel disease, radiation therapy, or adhesions from previous surgeries. Metabolic disorders or immune disorders, such as diabetes, cirrhosis of the liver, or pancreatic insufficiency can also attribute to this. We'll oftentimes test by using a breath test. There's two substrates or sugars that we use to elicit this. One is glucose, the other is lactulose. And we look for the rise in particular gases such as hydrogen or methane to identify a hydrogen predominant strain, a methane predominant strain, or a mixed predominant strain. There is also hydrogen sulfide, but we don't test for that here. Currently, the diagnosis and treatment um, is through antibiotics. The antibiotics that are recommended may be one singular antibiotic or a combination therapy, and we may even add Pepto-Bismol on for the hydrogen sulfide strain. Celiac disease is an autoimmune disease in the small intestine where it's damaged by a protein called gluten. Gluten is found in wheat, barley, rye, etc. This causes damage to the lining of the small intestine and the microvilli, which allows you to have poor absorption of food as it's not digested properly. This can lead to symptoms of oily, floating stools, weight loss, abdominal pain, diarrhea, bloating, lack of appetite, excessive gas. Right now, the cause of this is pretty unclear. We do know it's an autoimmune disease, and we do know that there is some genetic component. However, there can be an environmental component as well that we're just not quite sure about. For this, the gold standard diagnosis is an endoscopic biopsy of the small intestine, but we may screen for this utilizing blood labs. We also may utilize genetic testing in order to see if you even have the genetic, the genes to have celiac disease, especially when diagnosing becomes difficult. Right now, the first line therapy and the only therapy is uh, dietary intervention, which I will let Lily cover later. Last up is irritable bowel syndrome. What is irritable bowel syndrome? Well, my colleagues Diana McFarland and Dr. Justin Brandler did a wonderful talk on this, so if you have more questions, I would love for you to refer back to this. However, irritable bowel syndrome for this purpose is the Rome criteria, which is a pain predominant condition um, that has pain at least one day per week, greater than three months, when it's associated with a change in stool frequency, a change in stool caliber or consistency, and it's related to defecation. You have to have two of those for it to be irritable bowel syndrome. And for our purposes, I'm gonna talk about the entirety of IBS, including constipation predominance, diarrhea predominance, mixed or un unspecific. In relation to bloating, it is approximated that 96% of patients with irritable bowel syndrome have complaints of abdominal bloating. So why is this relevant to us? Well, because there are a few things on the market that can help with treatment. Some of the stuff helps with calming down the smooth muscle. Some helps with surfactant and collecting gas and expelling it. Some helps with neutralizing that gas. Um, the others help with digesting certain problematic foods, such as those fermentable, oligosaccharide, disaccharide, monosaccharide, and polyols. For the um, smooth muscle relaxation, peppermint oil can be helpful, and this is found with enteric coated peppermint oil. Um, Cymethicone is a surfactant that helps collect and expel gas. Activated charcoal can neutralize odors. And the last three are um, helping with helping break down these foods that are difficult to digest. So for those who have, are lactose intolerant or have difficulty breaking down the sugar lactose, a lactase enzyme can be helpful, whereas those who have difficulties with um, oligosaccharides, such as cruciferous foods or onions, betome may be helpful. Fodzyme is a new player to the game, and it is the only one that breaks down fructose enzymes. So this can be helpful at those, especially if you're having difficulty with pasta or um, noodle, or pasta or pizzas. Again, please refer to the previous um, Please refer to the previous lecture for more information on irritable bowel syndrome.
And that covers all the causes and treatments. I'm gonna hand this off to Lily to talk about the dietary discussion. All right. Hello, my name is Lily, and I'm a dietitian who works within the GI department alongside a team of fantastic providers, um, including Jennifer Fior. So today I'll be talking a little bit more about the dietary approaches to bloating. Specifically, we'll be reviewing some of the common therapeutic diets, their indications, and their contraindications as well. So as Jennifer mentioned, what causes bloating? There's numerous factors. Today we'll be reviewing a little bit more about the constipation onwards. Constipation, functional dyspepsia, gastroparesis, SIBO, celiac, food intolerances, and IBS. So firstly, constipation and fiber. So a common cause for constipation in many cases could be inadequate fiber intakes. So what even is fiber? Fiber is naturally occurring in all plant foods. So fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, legumes, grains, etc. And there's many benefits to having more fiber in the diet. It can help improve bowel regularity, so reducing constipation and bloating. Um, in addition to that, also reducing cholesterol, balancing your blood sugars, and many, many more. So what we have listed here on the screen are our daily recommended intakes. For women, that's approximately 25 grams. For men, somewhere around 38 grams. Over 95% of Americans consume less than their daily recommended intakes, and the average intakes are really only about 16 grams a day. So why, why are we seeing so many people with lower fiber intakes? It could be the increased availability of processed foods, decreased whole foods, and more recently, increased interest in gluten-free as well as wheat-free diets. So in terms of fiber, there are two types of fibers, which would be soluble as well as insoluble fibers. Firstly, soluble fibers, it's the one that dissolves in water. So take oatmeal, for example. If you put it in water, you might notice that it absorbs the water, becomes nice and gummy. Similarly, in our gut, um, consuming soluble fiber helps makes our stools become a bit more gel-like, and it also adds some bulk to our stools. So in addition to oatmeal, other examples of soluble fibers would be uh, fruits, sweet potatoes, legumes, and many more. The other type of fiber would be insoluble fiber. So this does not dissolve in water. So if I were to take a celery stick, stick it in a glass of water, nothing really happens. So in our bowels, something similar. It remains quite intact throughout our GI tract. And in terms of bowel habits, it helps to increase stool transit time. This type of fiber is found in our skins, seeds, fibrous vegetables, wheat bran, and more. So to help with constipation as well as the bloating component, I'd like to recommend trying to get fiber through a variety of sources, so both soluble and insoluble sources. Um, make sure that you're well hydrated. And if for any reason it's difficult to get enough fiber throughout the diet, sometimes a fiber supplement may be recommended. So another cause for bloating could be gastroparesis. And like Jennifer mentioned earlier, this is really just delayed stomach emptying. So the American College of Gastroenterologists mentioned that dietary management of gastroparesis would include focusing on a small particle diet to increase the likelihood of symptom relief and enhance gastric emptying. So a small particle diet is quite simply something that is texture modified um, something that breaks down the foods into smaller components. For example, like the bowl of pureed food in the image here. Um, but we do know that there is so much more than just texture modifications that can help improve gastric emptying. So one would be perhaps focusing on lower fat as well as lower fiber. Both of these food components delay gastric emptying. Another thing could be reducing the volume consumed at a single sitting. So that could be changing up your meal pattern to small frequent meals. By having more food at a time, it's going to add more work on your stomach and further slow gastric emptying. And at the end of the day, everyone um, has their own individual tolerances in, and intolerances. So gastro gastroparesis patients won't always all be alike. 
So celiac disease, um, there's really one treatment and method to go about this, and that would be a gluten-free diet. Um, so gluten, what it does in foods, it does provide chewiness and stretchiness to our baked goods. So that, that bite that you might get in a pizza crust or that bounce in a bread, it's usually because of the gluten content. I also have info on the screen, a little bit more about what the FDA um, means when they describe gluten-free in foods. So in short, it defines it as must have less than 20 parts per million of gluten in the food. Um, it is not a mandatory labeling requirement, so you won't see it on foods that are naturally gluten-free, some of them like fruits, vegetables, or corn chips, for example. And this only applies to packaged foods. So like I mentioned earlier, the fresh produce wouldn't be labeled as gluten-free. Now, gluten-free diets have been becoming increasingly popular. And my recommendation really is, uh, following a strict gluten-free diet, it is the only evidence-based dietary treatment for celiac disease. And in the absence of celiac disease, I usually do recommend avoiding unnecessary restriction of uh, gluten-containing foods. Now, I also do see in a lot of my patients, what if I do feel symptomatic eating bread or other wheat products? And that leads me to prompt a little bit more. Maybe it's something else in these wheat-containing foods. And that could be the fructan content of the foods. Fructan is the carbohydrate or sugar component in wheat foods versus gluten is actually the protein component in wheat foods. One who is sensitive to fructans may also be sensitive to other fructan containing foods, onion, garlic, beans. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about fructan content and fructan sensitivities later on in this presentation. Okay, so in terms of food intolerances, there are a few methods to go about in testing. One of them would be hydrogen breath tests. So the process of doing this would involve consuming a beverage with either fructose or lactose. Both of these are different types of sugars. After consuming these sugars, your hydrogen levels in your breath would be measured. So you'd be exhaling in some bag and the vials will be analyzed later on. So for context, in SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which was mentioned earlier, sugar is malabsorbed and becomes very readily available for our gut bacteria. So when we have bacteria and a lot of sugar in our gut, this creates a byproduct of gas, which can present as not only bloating in your gut, but also um, changes to your bowel habits and other GI symptoms. So sometimes hydrogen breath tests are used to evaluate SIBO. But some considerations about hydrogen breath tests is that it's better to be used as a screening tool and not very much as a diagnostic tool. Some of these considerations include the doses that are used in these tests are much, much higher than what you would actually consume in a meal. So if evaluating for lactose intolerance, for example, the amount of lactose that is consumed during the breath test would be the equivalent of about 30 ounces of milk, which for most people isn't a realistic amount of milk consumed in one sitting. Secondly, the results are also not always reproducible. All right, so for the second food intolerance um, testing method, we have food sensitivity or IgG tests. IgG stands for immunoglobulin, and this is an antibody in our blood. So, for example, if we eat an apple, our body is going to produce an apple IgG. In reality, the presence of the IgG is actually a normal immune system response to the exposure. So this method of testing for food sensitivities or food intolerances lacks evidence and it's not supported by many of the major organizations in the field of food allergies, including American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. So with that being said, how do I even test for my food intolerances? Well, one could be food journaling, and I have an example beside here. Um, it would involve, of course, tracking down the foods that you eat, perhaps timing, um, pace of eating, other fluids or medications around that time, stress levels, 
and then tracking down your symptoms. So this food journaling method not only tracks the food, but there could be other environmental factors that go into the food intolerance piece. Secondly, also could be a systematic elimination diet under RD guidance. And a common, you know, very well-known elimination diet is the FODMAP diet, which is used often in the case of patients with IBS and or SIBO. So what are FODMAPs? Um, it's an acronym. The F stands for fermentable. The O, D, M, P, oligosaccharides, disaccharides, etc. These are the names of different types of sugars. So we have roughly about three pounds of bacteria residing in our intestines. You know, they live and thrive off of the carbohydrates that we eat, and in turn, they keep our digestive tract healthy. Um, as a normal part of digestion, all carbs do break down into sugars in our digestive tract, and they're typically absorbed in our small intestines. However, certain sugars, FODMAPs, like I described earlier, are not well digested and not well absorbed. And this results in more sugar being available to our gut bacteria. This sugar could be an excess in our small intestine or our large intestine. And as we mentioned earlier, the combination of a lot of sugar plus gas or plus bacteria often results in gas, bloating, and other GI symptoms. <clears throat> So the FODMAP diet, in essence, is to limit these high FODMAP foods. So looking at the table here, oligosaccharides is one category that includes fructans and GOS. This includes the wheat, uh, rye, onion, garlic, legumes, which I mentioned a little bit earlier when we were talking about uh, people who may have sensitivities to wheat foods in an absence of celiac disease. We also have lactose. Um, and we're seeing an increased amount of people with lactose sensitivities. We have monosaccharides, an example of that would be fructose in honey, apple, mangoes, other fruits, as well as polyols, which we also call sugar alcohols, found in fruits, vegetables, and artificial sweeteners. <clears throat> so what the low FODMAP diet is, is a three-step elimination diet. The first phase of this diet would be the elimination phase, where for about two to six weeks' time, we are removing all the high and moderate FODMAP content foods and replacing it with low FODMAP alternatives. So for example, we saw wheat earlier was high FODMAP. We could swap wheat pasta for rice noodles instead. And rice is a low FODMAP food. Um, if I'm seeing you in my office, I will typically check in on patients after the first four to six weeks just to see if it, this diet worked or not. And in about 70% of cases, which has also been seen in studies, 70% um, of patients who have IBS find quite significant improvements on a low FODMAP diet. Um, this will be followed then by the FODMAP reintroduction phase. It is a continuation of the elimination diet, except that we are reintroducing one food at a time over subsequent days. So for example, we'll take out one food from a certain subgroup, we'll challenge that same one food with increasing doses over three days. This helps us, helps us determine tolerance for specific subgroups, as well as serving sizes within those subgroups. Eventually, after the reintroduction phase is completed, um, we want to add back all the tolerated foods back into the diet and then personalize and we'll adjust the diet in terms of the foods that were not as well tolerated. The long-term goal would be striking a good balance between tolerated FODMAP-rich foods, and it could be avoidance or limiting um, the FODMAP subgroups that you do not tolerate. <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, the FODMAP diet is very, very popular. So it, popular in practice, and is it possibly overprescribed? Um, in my nutrition appointments, I always question, is this diet appropriate for my patient? There are many considerations to factor in. Um, for example, do you go on vacation often? A strict diet like this would not be very feasible. Do you travel, or do you travel for work, eat out often, um, or even cooking? 
Are you cooking for other members of the household? And if so, by default, they may also be following the FODMAP diet. Or within the household, are you not the main cook? And it would be challenging for yourself to follow a diet with limit, limited cooking skills. Other considerations is medical history. Is the patient already on a complex diet? And this would add further restrictions. And it's always very, very important to consider the presence or history of either disordered eating and eating disorder patterns. Other health implications of a restrictive diet like the FODMAP diet could be reducing the intake of certain nutrients. In the case of the FODMAP diet, we could see lower fiber intakes, lower calcium, lower vitamin D intakes as well, and potentially more processed foods. So what else can I do? Um, what if food journaling or an elimination diet is just not right for me? Well, there is a, what I say, a no diet approach. It could be changing up your mealtime behaviors. For example, changing your diet pattern to small frequent meals, chewing your foods more thoroughly. As I like to say, digestion begins in the mouth. Uh, you could slow down your pace of eating best of your ability, maintain a calm and relaxed eating environment, make sure that you're well hydrated, limit excess intakes of caffeine, alcohol, spicy and or fatty foods, diaphragmatic breathing, and for those who aren't familiar with this term, it's a type of deep belly breathing. And this is evidence-based as well to help calm your gut as well as gentle movements, something like yoga or even a brisk walk after meals can help reduce bloat. So to summarize, one, many therapeutic diets exist. And two, is this diet right for me? So many diets that we see online may be promising to alleviate or maybe even resolve symptoms. But in reality, you know, most times it's not a one size fits all type of a scenario. I would advise that you consult your specialized GI provider and or registered dietitian to help determine the most appropriate diet for yourself and tailor it, and will help to tailor it to your individual needs. So with that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for listening in, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the QA session tonight.